By way of introduction, let me mention the following, which is an excerpt of an article that appeared in the New York Times titled, Ethics Debate Set Off by Life Science Gains. Quote, under attack are many of the traditional assumptions that underlie not only biology and medicine, but all science and technology. Among them are the beliefs that scientific progress is automatically good, that what is medically beneficial to the individual is necessarily good for society, and that scientists are the best judges of the direction in which their research should go. The article concluded with the observation that some problems, the definition of death, the use and distribution of organs for transplants, might be best dealt with through legislation. Others may be more appropriately handled through professional guidelines and the evolution of public consensus. Now that story appeared on March 28th of 1971. So here today, 40 years later, the debate rages on and any public consensus remains elusive. Few people better understand and indeed help to shape the medical ethics and healthcare debates than our final speaker this morning, Ezekiel Emanuel. One observer has estimated that Professor Emanuel has written more than a million words about healthcare. And actually, if you include his recent op-ed pieces in the New York Times, I think we may be up to a million, 200,000 or so, perhaps. An oncologist who was the founding chair of the Department of Bioethics at the Clinical Center of the National Institutes of Health, Professor Emanuel is a leading authority on global health and bioethics. He served as special advisor to the Obama administration on health policy. And he manages to maintain an active blog on food. At Penn, he is Diane V.S. Levy and Robert M. Levy University Professor with appointments in the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy in our Perlman School of Medicine and with the Department of Healthcare Management in the Wharton School. He also works with me as Vice Provost for Global Initiatives. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Ezekiel Emanuel. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here, and I was sure that if they put the break right before me, I'd be speaking to an empty uh, room. Uh, it's a tribute to uh, Penn alumni that you're sticking it out here uh, on this very lovely uh, day in New York City. Um, I have a, vi a bad virus uh, that I got at Thanksgiving, and so if my voice uh, goes down a little bit, uh, I apologize. It may be one of the first times in my life anyone says that they can't hear what I have to say. Um, that would be my brothers would say that. Uh, so I want to begin uh, uh, to talk about uh, something I call low-value medical services. Uh, but I want to begin with uh, an important fact about the cost of our health care system. Uh, last year, we spent $2.6 trillion on health care. And I know that a lot of people uh, uh, in this audience are very quantitative, really understand numbers. But when you get to the trillions, it's very hard to keep track of them. And uh, there are a variety of ways I like to keep that number in context. Uh, you may remember that Barb asked you how far it is to the moon. Uh, uh, one of the statistics I use is that actually if you stack 2.6 trillion single dollar bills on top of each other, very crisp, very new uh, dollar bills on top of each other, that's two thirds of the way to the moon. Those of you who remember the answer, that's about 170,000 miles to, to the moon. Just an astounding number. Another way to put it into context is the fact that uh, France is the fifth largest economy in the world, 66 million people, $2.6 trillion in 2010. Essentially, the American healthcare system is the fifth largest economy in the world. Just healthcare in our society. It's just an astounding, staggering amount of money. Uh, we spend anywhere between 20 and 40 percent more than the next highest country, Switzerland or Norway. They sort of bob back and forth. Um, we are way out uh, uh, spending much more than those countries. <clears throat> and the real question for policymakers and the real question that I struggled with when we were in the White House is, what should we do about that and the cost level? Now, there are a variety of possible approaches, but the three most common 
The first one is that we could increase the productivity and efficiency of the system. And there is a lot of inefficiency in our system. One way that we can definitely increase the efficiency that I've suggested in publication is uh, many of you go and you've gotten bills uh, for healthcare. That entire billing process is incredibly inefficient. Um, you get paper, you don't swipe the way you do with uh, credit cards. Um, the amount of e each insurance company has a different form, so there's no common clearinghouse like there is with Visa or MasterCard. Uh, it's an incredibly inefficient process, and pretty conservative estimates suggest that you know we could get 30 to 40 billion dollars per year out of that system without a lot of complicated electronics being introduced. The problem is to get a a uh, common platform, and that has turned out to be a real challenge. Part of healthcare reform will get us down that road. So we can increase the efficiency and the productivity of various parts of the system, and that certainly will be important. The second is we could increase the use of high value interventions. Those are interventions that are relatively cheap, but are very, very big improvements in healthcare. We know that when we look around at the quality of the American healthcare system, there are a lot of things that we uh, know work, whether it's aspirin and uh, blood pressure control uh, and cholesterol control to prevent heart disease, uh, or it's certain kinds of screening uh, that we are just not doing very well uh, of. There are lots of people uh, who don't get those healthcare services. It's estimated that about 40% of the Medicare beneficiaries who have high blood pressure don't even know they have high blood pressure. It hasn't been measured and communicated to them, much less controlled. So there's a lot of things we can do to improve uh, the use of high value interventions. That would be great in terms of increasing the health of the American population, but if you're really focused on the cost control side, it doesn't do a whole lot to actually bring down costs. It might actually in fact, raise costs. The last thing you can do is decrease the use of low value interventions. And by low value, I mean interventions that either don't increase health or don't increase health a lot, but cost a lot of money. As I mentioned, I'm interested in this last one. Getting, I sort of keep it in my mind in the, in the category of getting rid of junk. So we're gonna talk about getting rid of junk. Sorry, I normally don't drink during speaking, but you can hear my voice is going. So Avastin is a drug that has been developed uh, by a big pharma company out in California, Genentech, and it's been used for a number of diseases, breast cancer, or metastatic breast cancer being one. And in 2008, Avastin received accelerated FDA approval for use in the treatment of patients with metastatic breast cancer. And the decision was made on preliminary data, studies that showed that Avastin uh, slowed the progress of the spread of breast cancer, although in that article it did not either increase the length of survival, so women didn't actually live longer even though the breast cancer was going at a slower rate, and it did not improve the quality of life. FDA approved the drug but required subsequent studies, and those studies have shown that Avastin doesn't actually improve quality of life or overall survival. They really confirm the initial result, and that it has actually some significant side effects. There are a few women who we can't predict beforehand who do benefit from Avastin and actually live a long time with it. As a consequence of these new studies, in November 2011, the FDA revoked Avastin's approval for the use in metastatic breast cancer. <clears throat> now the cost of Avastin is about $88,000 per breast cancer patient. After that November uh, decision, Medicare announced that it's gonna continue to pay for Avastin for metastatic breast cancer. Blue Shield of California and Kaiser announced that they are not gonna pay for Avastin. And so one of the questions that I think is quite interesting uh, is about this kind of decision. Now one of the challenges of making the decision not to pay for a drug like Avastin is that it constantly gets demagogued as a case of rationing. 
Um, I can att attest to that, having experienced that demagoguery personally a lot. Here's Senator David Vitter uh, from Louisiana, who after the FDA's decision wrote, the fact remains that thousands of women today depend upon Avastin as a vital tool in their fight against breast cancer. And the FDA should not have taken that option off the table by rationing access. And so you can see why decision makers in Washington or even decision makers in insurance companies would have an allergic reaction to looking at a drug like Avastin and deciding whether to cover it or not. So I want to ask you the following question. Is the decision by Blue Shield of California and Kaiser not to pay for Avastin in the breast cancer setting, is that rationing? If you think it's rationing, raise your hands. Almost eh, spattering, maybe 5 or 10 percent, maybe 15. Those who don't think it's rationing, raise your hand. Well, clearly the overwhelming majority of people. So one of the questions I think this raises is, what actually is rationing? What does the public think is rationing? And so one of the things we're going to study and think about is different kinds of decisions that can be made in the healthcare setting and different ways in which they could be made. So this is a somewhat complicated grid, and I want you to think about it. Um, so you can see <clears throat> along the uh, top, there are some treatments which are high cost and no benefit over the standard treatment. Uh, if insurance refuses to pay, is that rationing? If insurance says, listen, we'll pay whatever the cheapest amount of the most effective treatment is, and you, patient, have to pay the difference, would that be rationing? Well, that's for a high cost, no benefit treatment. What about a high cost treatment that has some benefits in terms of convenience? It's easier to take. Maybe it's an oral pill or you don't need as much medication, or it doesn't cause as much nausea. What about a high cost treatment that doesn't have zero benefit, but a small amount of benefit? Would refusing to pay for that be rationing? Would requiring someone to pay the marginal cost be rationing? And what about something that really works, significantly improves survival, or maybe even cures someone, but also has these tens and hundreds of thousands of price tags. So we're trying to understand where people are on this. So what I'm going to do is go through uh, a few scenarios, and we're going to have a conversation, an interactive conversation, about whether these things are rationing or not. So first one for actually the men over 50 hits close to home. Proton beam therapy is a type of radiation used to treat cancers. Protons are positively charged nuclei. They're basically hydrogen atoms with the electron stripped off. And to generate one, you need a particle accelerator, and you have to enclose it in a football-sized uh, building lined with lead and lots of concrete. The advantages of protons, in theory, are that they can be focused much more precisely where the cancer is, so reducing the chance that they might cause damage to surrounding healthy tissue. Now, proton therapy has been demonstrated to be the absolute best approach for brain cancers and spinal cord tumors in children. Because there, you've got a developing brain, and you really can't afford any damage around it. The good news, I guess, is that there aren't very many of those tumors in the United States. Among 300 million Americans, there are only 3,000 a year, one in 15,000 children uh, each year develops a pediatric brain or spinal cord tumor. Now, it's impossible to pay for a proton beam machines uh, across the country, the capital cost, on just 3,000 patients a year. And the consequence is that doctors are looking around for other uses of proton beam radiation therapy, and one place they've landed on is newly diagnosed prostate cancer. Currently, there are actually nine proton beam facilities in the United States operating today, including one, for those of you who visited the Penn campus recently, at the University of Pennsylvania, shared between us and CHOP Hospital. More importantly, there are 20 at various stages of development uh, from construction to on the drawing board and getting capital financing. Uh, just a few months ago, 
Mayo Clinic had a very big announcement that they're going to build not one, but two facilities, one in Minnesota and one in Scottsdale, Arizona. Each one of these buildings is going to cost more than $180 million. Now, what do we know about proton beam therapy in the case of prostate cancer? It has never been directly compared to standard treatments for prostate cancer. There's absolutely no head-to-head -head comparison, no data showing that it's better or even equal to standard radiation, to surgery, or observation therapy. Medicare pays for proton beam therapy about $59,000. And for the standard radiation therapy, which is, goes by the acronym IMRT, it pays $26,000, more than $30,000 gap. So the question is, do you agree or disagree with Medicare's decision to pay for proton beam therapy for prostate cancer? Do you agree with Medicare's decision to pay? Raise your hands if you do. Again, we're in the sort of 5 10% rate. Do you disagree with Medicare's decision? We're in the, I don't know, 50%? You don't know, or you're uncertain. Mm, a quarter, a third, and maybe you haven't voted like most of the American population. But the, <laughs> the majority here, or, or at least the plurality of the room, and I think the majority of who voted, uh, don't agree with Medicare's decision to pay $59,000 for pro proton beam. So if Medicare did not pay for proton beam therapy for prostate cancer, would that be rationing? If you think it's rationing, raise your hands. Again, we've got a, just a smattering, maybe 5%. You don't think it would be rationing. Raise your hands. and Put them up high so I can see here. So we're in the sort of, again, 50 60%. There are two little kids over there, under voting age, who are voting. <laughs> they must be pretty smart. What class are you guys in? Those of you who aren't sure whether it's rationing or not. Just a small number. All right. So like the Avastin case, most of the people think it would be acceptable not to pay for proton beam, and most people don't think it would constitute rationing. Let's switch from proton beam for prostate cancer. I know men are getting very uncomfortable now, but let's switch from that to a drug called Provinge, which you may have heard of, was approved about a year ago. Um, unlike, it's not for newly diagnosed prostate cancer, it's for metastatic prostate cancer, that is prostate cancer that's spread beyond the prostate. Compared to placebo, Provinge extends life by an average of four months, uh, from 21 months with no treatment for uh, the cancer to 25 months with treatment with Provenge. Dendrion, the uh, company that uh, makes Provenge, priced it at 93000 per patient. Its justification is that they spent more than a billion dollars in research and development related to Provenge. Medicare, after it was approved by the FDA, decided that it would pay Pro, for Provenge, and it would pay $93,000 per patient to be treated. Do you agree or disagree with Medicare's decision to pay Provenge? Those people who agree, please raise your hands. Interesting. I think a little more than the proton beam. Those who disagree with Medicare's decision, also interesting a little more. Maybe a lot more people feel activated by this problem. Those who are unsure. I might say those two little kids, they're never unsure. <laughs> if Medicare didn't pray for Provenge, would that be rationing? Those who think it would be rationing, please raise your hand. So more people think if they didn't pay for Provenge, it would be rationing. Those who disagree say that if they didn't pay, it would be, wouldn't be rationing. Now that looks like a majority. I wish we had a very precise measure here. Those who are unsure whether it would be rationing or not. Very few here. So again, Provenge looks a little bit like uh, a proton beam, although not quite as uh, confident uh, in terms of thinking that it's okay for or people disagreeing with Medicare's coverage. If Medicare did not pay for Provenge, 
but some people decided to pay out of pocket for it, would that be unfair or unjust? Those people who think it would be unjust if some people could buy it out of pocket, please raise your hands. Not very many at all. Those people who don't think it would be unjust if only people who could pay. Interesting. All right. We should correlate that with income here. Um, <laughs> you have a prediction, obviously. Uh, those people who are unsure whether it would be unfair or not need to take a course on justice, right? Okay. So the last case I want to talk about is Abraxane versus Taxol and metastatic breast cancer. Abraxane and Taxol actually are the same drug, Taxol, um, and both are used to fight uh, metastatic breast cancer. That's breast cancer that's spread beyond the breast and is not really any longer curable. Um, so you're treating for length of life and, and quality of life. The difference is that Abraxane is essentially a form of Taxol that's delivered in a new type of particle uh, so it uh, doesn't float out into other parts of the body. Compared to Taxol for metastatic breast cancer, Abraxane slows the progression of the disease and pa patients respond better to it. But importantly, there is no difference between Abraxane and Taxol when it comes to overall survival. So while it may allow the tumor to grow more slowly, it actually doesn't extend life. I know this is hard to grasp. We actually see this quite commonly in cancer. Um, so Abraxane has got the same in uh, uh, result in terms of uh, overall survival. But Abraxane is much more convenient than regular Taxol. Maybe some of you have had friends who've had Taxol. You know that it's a very difficult drug uh, to give. There are lots of reactions to it. But women who get Abraxane for metastatic breast cancer don't need to receive steroids before getting the uh, Abraxane. And you therefore can uh, infuse the drug much more rapidly because you're not worried about these bad allergic and other reactions. It turns out that for a weekly treatment, Abraxane is $15,000 and Taxol is only $3,500 per week. I say only. At $3,500 per week, most of us would be in the poorhouse if we had to pay for it out of pocket. So if Medicare did not pay for Abraxane for metastatic breast cancer, would that be rationing? Who thinks it would be rationing? Well, about 15% here. Who thinks it would not be rationing? No. Who is unsure? Please raise your hand. More unsures here. The plurality is clearly don't think it would not be rationing, but I think a lot more people are uncertain. What if Medicare said, we're going to pay $3,500 for Abraxane, and that if women who got Abraxane would then have to pay the difference between $15,000 and $3,500 kind of like getting the brand name drug and having to pay the higher copay. Who thinks that that would be rationing? Raise your hands. About 10%. Who thinks that would not be rationing? About half the people. Who is unsure about this? Okay, just a few. Well, let me go back to this slide and grid at the start. We've had a case here of high cost, no benefit treatment. We've actually had two cases of that, the Avastin at the start and uh, the proton beam therapy. We don't know whether the proton beam therapy actually has a benefit. All we know is it hasn't been shown uh, in any head-to-head -head comparison. Most of you thought that it was not rationing if an insurance company decided not to pay for it. Some of you did think it was rationing. So in this category, high cost, no proven benefit, you seem to be, or most of you at least, seem to be comfortable that that's okay, refusing to pay for it, and that doesn't constitute rationing. Notice you don't happen to agree with Senator Vitters, who did think that would constitute rationing. What about higher added cost, or higher cost, but added convenience, the Abraxane Taxol example? Well, again, most of you thought that would not be rationing to refuse to pay for Abraxane, even though it does have an advantage of convenience. And most of you also did not think it would be a problem uh, if in 
Medicare or an insurance company said you had to pay the marginal cost, the difference between the Taxol price and the Abraxane price, that would not constitute rationing. And then what about higher cost and smaller advantage? That's the Provinge case, where it adds four months at a cost of 93000 Again, interestingly, most of you thought that was not rationing if Medicare refused to pay for it. Um, uh, but there was probably more people who did think that was rationing. I didn't give you the last case. Uh, there are some in oncology. It's not that we only make marginal differences. Sometimes we do have home runs and actually substantially prolong life or actually even cure patients for high cost. But what I'm planning to do over the next few months is to actually take scenarios like this and to interview actual cancer patients receiving treatment, both for metastatic breast cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, and other cancers, and find out what their views. How close are their views to your view? How close does actually having the cancer actually change your mind? We're also interested in what oncologists who actually treat patients think. And finally, we're interested in what people like you, the public, think. I will tell you, I've done these scenarios in a group like this with cancer doctors. And the prediction is, we'll have to ask Barbara, but they actually look a lot like you. They don't think most of these cases of refusing to pay are uh, uh, rationing and they think they disagree with Medicare's coverage decision in most of these cases. But that's going to be the research uh, for the time. I think the real potential and the reason I'm interested in it is the David Vitter's quote. When you get inside the Beltway in Washington and you talk about the fact that a lot of these treatments are $90,000, $93,000 for four months or maybe even no months, Aides to senators, people at Medicare say, we can't touch that, it's rationing. Well, what happens if the public doesn't think it's rationing? What happens if the public is acceptable with it? What happens if cancer patients are acceptable with it? I think that would dramatically change the conversation in this country about health care costs, and that's what I'm interested in doing. Thank you, and let's have some questions. Questions over here. Remember, microphones are coming. Let us know who you are. One little comment, and then the question. I think who are you, and what, what oh, class? Ramesh Gitamal in the class of '76. I think you have to remember David Vitter's prostitute had uh, metastatic breast cancer. <laughs> <laughs> but now the statement: Wouldn't all of this be irrelevant if we could just put a price on human life and we decide that? a human life was worth ten million dollars and therefore you know each year was worth a million dollars and we could just figure it out from there and the numbers would just fall into place so there, there are two things first of all uh... it's interesting that you mentioned uh... A human life would worth, be worth about ten million dollars uh... that's substantially higher a hundredfold higher than what actually when people do cost effectiveness analysis they actually measure a human life worth an added quality adjusted life year is worth a, between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars on most calculations um, so you're actually adding uh, a lot uh, I think the high end of what people say a whole life is worth is about two point five million dollars so what that number is substantially influences what you would cover and what you wouldn't cover that's the first point the second point is, um, and I can personally attest to this point, uh, having been attacked for it, uh, the American public is not happy about putting a number, a dollar value on human life. Other countries, it turns out, are not so gun-shy about it. In England, they have an organization called the National Institutes for Clinical Effectiveness, dubbed NICE, that does officially do cost-effectiveness analyses of medical treatments. And they do have an implied dollar amount. Theirs is 33,000 pounds, or roughly $50,000, for a quality-adjusted life year. And there, the NICE has a huge amount of power, which is what they decide is covered and what they decide is not covered immediately translates into the National Health Service. So they actually control whether something's on or off. And as you might imagine, um, they have been attacked. And they've been attacked 
uh, on the particular issue of whether denying Avastin not for breast cancer but for colon cancer, where it was initially approved, uh, is acceptable or not. And this puts the political establishment, and in particular the prime minister, under extreme pressure. Similar thing happens in Israel, um, and there have been hunger strikes and sit-in strikes in front of the prime minister's house there um, over coverage decisions like this. Interestingly, in both those countries, the government stood fast and said, no, we have this process. It's the fairest we can do. Um, but I would submit to you, we would not tolerate, our politicians are not in that ballpark. And so I don't think we are easily going to get to a stage where we're going to put a dollar figure on human life and then have it implemented in policy coverage. We're going to get there, as we always do in the United States, in a much more messy route. And I think, you know, some of our data will suggest how messy or how uh, uh, straightforward the process becomes. There's a question over here. Uh, Arthur Bass, uh, 73. You hear a lot of talk that drugs are cheaper in Canada or other countries. Uh, the 93,000 figure for ProVage, would that be 50,000 in Canada? And is there something about our system that makes the cost higher? Okay, a really good question. Does our, something in our system make cost high? Let me make three points about that. <clears throat> the first is, in the case of something like Provenge or Avastin or Abraxane, Medicare cannot actually negotiate prices. It's by law prohibited from negotiating prices. And one of the questions we're interested in is, does the public think that's right? Do patients think that's right? or would they want a negotiated rate, and how low would that price go if they thought they should negotiate it? I'll give you a preliminary look when we in a, uh, talk to oncologists um, about that and what was the price point that they thought it would be acceptable. It turns out to be lower than 93,000, but not exactly a bargain. Uh, they had a nice bell-shaped curve around 25 to $30,000. Um, so, you might get lowering prices. Second, how do our prices on these drugs compare to the rest of um, the world? Uh, they are lower in the rest of the world. We do have the highest prices for brand name drugs like Provinge and Abraxane and Avastin. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the consequences of NICE, which I mentioned in England, is that it actually forces companies to bring the price down so that they can get just under that 33,000 mark and therefore be covered. So it actually has a very interesting effect um, on things. Um, but the last thing I would say is, <clears throat> uh, uh, and, and this may seem to undercut what I have, uh, the reason we're doing the research, at least when it comes to drugs, drugs constitute about 10% of what we spend in healthcare. So of that $2.6 trillion, about 260 billion of it goes to drugs. In the United States, we actually have had a tremendous shift over the last uh, five or six years to using more generic drugs, which are substantially cheaper. Now about 70% of prescriptions, 75% of prescriptions are uh, generic drugs. We actually have the lowest generic prices in the world. So we have a crazy situation where when it comes to a brand name, we're the highest in the world. When it comes to generics, we're actually the lowest. Many of us think we should be somewhere in between. Uh, uh, for a while, but that's not where our system is going, and I don't think we're going to have a situation of more price regulation uh, on the brand name, if you want to know the truth. Uh, Professor Emanuel? Yeah. Uh, Mark Werner, uh, 1980. Um, if I were to tie back your presentation to the first presentation around forecasting, let me ask you a uh, forecasting question. Um, given the government's increasing role in, in health care, um, and given their uh, history or track record in controlling costs of large organizations they manage, what is your level of optimism in terms of them being able to manage healthcare costs going forward? So uh, that's a great question, and let me uh, uh, begin by uh, asking a question in an adjacent box. Uh, no one's been good about controlling healthcare costs, not the government and not private industry. Um, and, uh, you know, I know that a lot of big companies, the CEOs get really irate about their increasing health care costs, but if you look at their track record, it's no better than the U.S. government's. Um, and we have had health care inflation 
way in excess of growth of the GDP for the last 30 plus years. So that's the bad news. The good news is, for a variety of reasons which I didn't present uh, in today's talk, I think the health care reform bill actually gives us a lot of tools that will in fact do better at moderating health care costs. Um, there are a lot of changes around uh, what I call the delivery system, how doctors and hospitals are paid that are actually going to reduce costs. There are the insurance exchanges that are going to come online in 2014 are going to be a good way of putting pressure on insurance company uh, costs. So I'm actually uh, an optimist about the fact that by the end of the decade, we're going to actually have a substantially better system, uh, and we will have uh, put a lid on uh, healthcare costs. One of the things that I experience when I go around to a lot of hospitals, a lot of uh, 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 medical meetings, is how much attention now doctors and hospitals are paying to costs and to getting costs out of the system. That wasn't true prior to healthcare reform. And so healthcare reform in the Affordable Care Act has made a huge difference in changing the psychology uh, of doctors. I will just give you an example um, from the University of Pennsylvania. This past week, I flew in yesterday from Africa uh, doing some of my global initiatives uh, work there. And while I was in Africa, we had a conference call, the head of the health system, Ralph Muller, myself, and a few others, trying to think through how we can reduce readmission rates into the hospital. So one of the things you may know is that about 20% of people on Medicare get readmitted to the hospital within 30 days of their discharge. Not a great record. That's true nationally, not at Penn. And the new health care reform bill dings hospitals, reduces their reimbursement if they have a high readmission rate. Well, we have an innovative practice at Penn called transition care management that works with patients who are being discharged who are at high risk of returning, either because of their disease, because they have multiple diseases, because of their age and other things. So we had a call. Could we put this program on steroids, if you will, and really try to ramp it up and see how much we're saving? We know that in some preliminary pilot testing for 150 high-risk patients, we actually do save and reduce readmissions and save money. So here we are talking to the chief medical officer, P.J. Brennan, Ralph Muller, myself, the nurse who developed this program, and others are actively now working on, let's roll it out, let's try to bring it, its cost down, let's see how big an impact we have, let's measure the savings, and let's get people like Medicare and the insurance companies to work on it. I just want to say three years ago, that conversation wasn't happening. It wasn't in the hospital's interest to have it. People didn't think about it. That's all changed because of health care reform. So if you ask me, am I an optimist or a pessimist, I'm an optimist that we're actually going to get our arms around this problem over the next decade. Time for just one more quick question. Gary Service, Wharton 86. Um, when you were talking about proton beam therapy, it brought up uh, a quaint concept of certificates of need um, <laughs> that used to exist. And my question basically is, does that amount to rationing? And do you see any role of certificates of need moving forward in controlling this kind of equipment? Um, boy, we are getting really great. And this is a really specific policy question. So it used to be in the 70s um, that if a hospital wanted to build an extension to the hospital or add operating rooms or install some high-tech equipment. In many states, not all states, they actually had to go and get the state's approval to make that construction and to add those operating rooms. And that was called the certificate of need. You had to demonstrate that there was a need for your service. Well, in some states, it turned into a, you know, they didn't go and show there was a need. They've showed we're increasing employment and you know, we have to maintain our status as the best or cutting edge or competition, not just in our local area, but also nationally so that Boston would remain ahead of New York, uh, et cetera. And so certificates of need increasingly became meaningless. On the other hand, there were studies that showed states that actually enforced certificates of need had lower healthcare inflation. And there was this issue of, uh, supply driving demand so that if you had an operating room, by God, you used it and therefore costs went up. My bet that I ain't coming back no matter what the data show. And so I don't think you're going to see that. On the other hand, you are going to see the market take an effect not too dissimilar. 
So most hospitals, to build a new wing with new beds or to build more operating rooms, goes to the bond market and raises funds to fund that. And the question is, will the bond market pay for that in an era where there's increasing focus on cost control and uncertainty about the, uh, uh, whether hosp new, more hospital beds are needed or a fancy-dancy uh, proton beam uh, machine is needed. And that, I think, is going to be some of the fiscal discipline that's going to come into healthcare. You're going to see um, less expansion uh, than we have seen uh, hitherto and a rethinking of what kinds of expansion we need. Do we need more hospital beds?